I'm very interested because you take two triplets and you just create a connection to it. I'm a little surprised that it's just double the power. How are you able to just put two of these Lego blocks together and they work perfectly in sync with each other to output double the power instead of maybe like 1.3 times the power because of some mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that's the key structural element or the key piece of technology behind chiplets is that way that you interconnect this. Normally, there's a lot of techniques to interconnect these chiplets. Some one technique is to use Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to the It's a Material World podcast. I'm Philippe and joining me is David. So what's new, David? I know it's been a while since since we've recorded. So there's been a few things that have changed, I feel like, for both of us. Yeah, I think that uh, you more so than me. It's been uh, pretty good recently. I've just been hanging out and doing a little bit of travel around California, but I'm about to leave for a work trip to Germany. So doing some international wow. travel, which will be very exciting. But I, I think you have a much more exciting update here, though. <laughs> I guess so. I, I mean, Germany is pretty exciting. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, I, I think for anybody that's watching us on YouTube, you can maybe see them in a different background. So I've officially moved to Chicago. And so this is our first podcast episode with me in, in the new city, in the Windy City. So yeah, I think I'm, I'm super excited. Unfortunately, you can't really see it. I was trying to show David here offline, but behind me is, is the river. And then in front of me, what I get to look at every day is Millennium Park, just a couple blocks away. So really excited about the location, just settling in. but. It's still taken some time despite me moving like probably over a month ago since I've also been in India for a couple of weeks, was in Miami for a weekend too. So still very much settling in and, and getting the place furnished and everything like that. So it's been a good time. Um, again, if anybody happens to be here in Chicago, you know, don't hesitate to reach out. Would love to would love to hang out and catch up. But let's get let's get into the episode now. We we talk about organic electronics and electronic packaging with uh, Benedict. And so it was a really interesting episode kind of hearing about flexible display technologies is kind of one of those main applications in this space. And David, I just wanted to hear if you had any highlights that you want to maybe point out for our listeners. Yeah, I thought my favorite part was definitely when you talked about the organic photovoltaics in that field. It's actually quite interesting what we can do with the organic polymers and the uh, films that we can use to not only like supplement the silicon, the normal silicon photovoltaics, but also add new like features and benefits. And for example, there's a certain type of film that we can add that it will take in UV light and emit like visible light. And so he was talking about how that could increase efficiency on windy day. I thought that was really interesting and just kind of shows how we can just continue to build upon existing technologies to make more efficient ones, especially when it comes to new material selection and other things of that nature. Yeah, definitely. I think my favorite part of the episode was when he went into kind of the different material interfaces and, and the challenges there in the semiconductor field. Just, you know, I was always curious about you know, how many materials are interacting with each other. It's a lot of different material types as well. What are some of those like innovations that are happening in semiconductor packaging? And, you know, basically how does a material scientist make an impact there? And I think it boils down to material selection as well as knowledge of those structure property relationships. So I think he gave a really good example and, and just a really in-depth answer there. So just something to, to look out for, especially if you are interested in joining the semiconductor industry or if you're already in the semiconductor industry. So, yeah, I think I think that's it. We'll get into the episode. But before that, we would just really appreciate if you could leave a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. That really helps us grow and and bring this podcast to to more and more listeners who are interested in the material science space. So without further ado, let's get into it. All right. Hello, everyone. For today's guest, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Benedict, San Jose Principal Materials Process and Integration Development Engineer at DECA Technologies, which is a company based on developing semiconductor packaging technology. 
Benedict earned his PhD and master's in material science, specifically in polymer chemistry, from Kyoto University in 2014 and 2010, as well as his bachelor's in materials engineering from the University of Philippines. Benedict has worked at NXP Semiconductors Philippines, Kyoto University, and SunPower, where he has worked on liquid crystals and solar cells. Currently, he works on semiconductor patching at DECA. Benedict is an expert in conjugated polymers, organic electronics, and electronic packaging, with over 20 years in all these areas together. Benedict, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you, David, for the kind introduction, and thank you, Puneet, as well, for inviting me to this podcast. I'm really looking forward to this recording. And so, as the title of the episode suggests, we want to get into organic electronics, and so let's just start by defining what makes organic electrons work or electronics work. These words, organic and electronics, kind of defy the stereotypical definitions of material classes, especially in in this electronics realm. And so interestingly, I feel like this has been a recurring theme with our podcast episodes is focusing on areas outside of the traditional or expected material classifications. So can you just start by giving us a definition of organic electronics and what What are the basic ideas in this space that make organic electronics work? Yes. Thank you, Puneet. And that's a very good question. In fact, hearing about conductive polymers and organic electronics while I was still an undergrad student fascinated me and that sent me down a path to working on organic electronics and electronics packaging. So we material scientists traditionally classify our materials into neat little boxes, right? Where we know that metals have good mechanical strength, have excellent thermal and electrical conductivity. Meanwhile, ceramics are known to have high mechanical strength, have high thermal and resistance, and have, are good electrical insulators. Polymers, on the other hand, can have varied mechanical strength and toughness. They have excellent flexibility and are poor electrical conductors. So all of these characteristics come down to the nature of the intermolecular bonds of these materials. Now let's look deeper into polymers. They can be described as long chains of organic or carbon-based molecules. The easiest way to imagine polymers on a molecular level is to think of cooked spaghetti noodles. Each noodle is an individual polymer chain and each noodle can have different lengths. Some noodles would tangle with each other while some would slide past each other. Some noodles can have branches, some are flat, some are hollow, some are flexible and some can be very stiff. So because of these variations, polymers can exhibit a wide range of properties, from the flimsy plastic bags that we use for groceries to plexiglass that are very stiff, and to the tough yet flexible aramid fibers used in bulletproof vests. So unlike metals, polymers do not have a sea of free electrons shared between the polymer chains, right? So that's why polymers are traditionally poor electrical conductors. So electrically conductive polymers have what you call a conjugated main chain structure. When you say conjugated, it means that the polymer chains have alternating single and double bonds. So by doping the polymer chain with ionic molecules, positive or negative charges are generated between these polymer chains to create electrical conductivity. So this was first discovered by Professor Shirakawa, he and McDiarmid during the 1970s where they took polyacetylene film, they doped it with iodine, and increased electrical conductivity of the film by seven orders of magnitude. So aside from winning the 2000 Nobel Prize in chemistry, this discovery paved the way for the development of conductive polymers and organic electronics. So we see this now in modern technology, such as organic LEDs on our phones, those cool electronically activated airplane windows that darken at the push of a button and also the flexible displays used in our latest folding cell phones. So, Benedict, I really appreciate you giving that that background, and I was just curious, what what applications or what niches do organic electron, electronics, where, where they can make an impact over the traditional metals or, or the, the other materials that are, that are commonly used in this space? Okay, yeah. So, conductive polymers are the main technology for electronic displays. So as you can know, or as we commonly know that we see these in our everyday electronics, such as organic LEDs, the flexible displays on our phones and our TVs. So for example, let's take, for example, organic LEDs. 
So they use electroluminescent polymers that produce light at different colors. And upon excitation by electricity, this creates the individual pixels in these displays. In addition to OLEDs, organic field effect transistors, are also used in the flexible displays to switch the individual pixels on and off. And the e-ink displays are also used for smart writing pads and Kindles for, for our devices. And we also have those dimmable glass from polymer liquid crystals that dim the airplane windows at the touch of a button. And we've also seen the emergence of mass-produced solar cells or organic solar cells. All of these are made possible by conductive polymers and organic electronics. So when we think of polymers, usually people's first idea is like a plastic. And plastics are normally known for being more able to like fail under fatigue, so under multiple use. Do these organic electronics also have issues with fatigue? Or can we reuse these like organic electronics over and over again without any degradation of performance? I think they're not really meant for, you know, uh, as structural materials. So they could be quite uh, sensitive compared to other traditional electronics that are inorganic based. And uh, normally these are well-tuned polymer structures that have very specific structures and properties. And usually they're meant for specific purposes. So it's not really part of their function to be recycled. But there's a lot of uh, research going on to make these materials sustainable or more green in the future. Uh, another thing that you've worked on extensively is the um, packaging side of the electronics industry. Could you describe the scope of this field and maybe how it's evolved over time? Yeah, thank you, David. So when we talk about electronics or semiconductor packaging, most people would often mistake this as the physical packaging used to ship our electronic device. This could be in the form of boxes or containers or tape reels. So lay people are often confused by this. So semiconductor packaging refers to the technologies that encapsulate and protect the silicon IC chips or integrated circuit chips from the outside world. And they provide the electrical connections from the silicon chip to the electronic device. A common image of the semiconductor package would be the black plastic rectangles with solder balls or metal pins sticking out of them which are soldered to the phone or the PC motherboard. So during the 1970s up to the 2000s, semiconductor packaging was an afterthought in the industry. During those decades, engineers would design the latest semiconductor chips with the highest density of transistors crammed into the smallest area possible. Then they would hand it over to the packaging engineers for assembly and call it a day. Fast forward to the present as silicon IC chips are getting smaller Packing and packing more transistors prove to be more expensive, more difficult, and they take more time to develop the next generation or nodes of these IC chips. We are at a point where Moore's law is approaching a plateau. And if you may not know this, Moore's law tells us that the number of transistors in an IC chip doubles every two years. This has been true from the 1970s to the 2010s, but in the recent decades, we are seeing advancements of IC slowing down below the pace uh, predicted by Moore's law. So this slowdown has forced chip makers to look for a new approach to boost IC chips performance. And they looked at semiconductor packaging to provide the solution. This new approach is what we call in the industry as chiplets. You can think of chiplets as high-tech Lego blocks. So instead of building IC chips with multiple blocks, such as the processor, the memory, or the graphics processor, from a single piece of silicon, chip makers build these chiplets from multiple pieces of silicon and connect them together using advanced packaging. Thank you. So David and I have a lot of friends that are in the semiconductor space, so I've seen a lot of titles of you know packaging engineer within that space. So I just wanted to ask, what are some of those challenges in the packaging electronics field that you're facing now? I know you talked about Moore's Law kind of, you know, approaching that plateau. What does that mean from the packaging side? How does that affect your your day-to-day -day work or just continuing to innovate in this field? Yeah, thank you, Punit. That's a very good question. So as I said earlier, much of the packaging development in our industry is now focused on chiplets. 
So for chip makers, it would be quicker and cost effective to mix and match these Lego IC blocks at different technology generations and connect them together through packaging. So let's take, for example, a AI server chip where the chip maker will use the latest generation or node for the processor block. Meanwhile, other chiplets such as the IO or input or output or memory can be made using more reliable or early generation, earlier generation technology. So this chiplet strategy allows the AI server chip to be more cost effective, wherein the chiplet makers could produce it at a shorter time to market. So a good example of this chiplet strategy is Apple's M1 Ultra, which we have always heard in the news or in the internet articles about their latest laptops, right? So for Apple's M1 Ultra, you have two M1 Max die processors electronically connected using a silicon bridge so that this M Ultra chip behaves like a single chip. So with chiplets, this M1 Ultra can have the processing power of two M1 processors without needing to build one very large and expensive chip. So as we integrate these chiplet blocks into a single package, we encounter various challenges. So one challenge is the package stress. So chiplets can be interconnected side by side in a 2D arrangement or can be stacked on top of each other in a 3D arrangement or even combinations of both. So as chiplets are interconnected in this 2D or 3D architectures, different materials with different coefficients of thermal expansion or CTE will cause between stress between the package or within the package. This could lead to defects during manufacturing or even during service life. Aside from that, as we have more powerful chiplet components working together, thermal dissipation and thermal management between these components is another challenge that we are looking closely into. And of course, providing the high-speed electrical connections between these chiplets within the package is a key area of development. Interesting. Maybe, uh, I'm not sure if you know the answer to this or can explain it easily, but I'm very interested because you take two chiplets and you just create a connection to it. I'm a little surprised that it's just double the power. How are you able to just put two of these Lego blocks together and they work perfectly in sync with each other to output double the power instead of maybe like 1.3 times the power because of some in mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that's the key structural element or the key piece of technology behind chiplets is that way that you interconnect this. Normally, there's a lot of techniques to interconnect these chiplets. Some One technique is to use a silicon bridge chip, or essentially it's almost like another silicon chip that provides these electrical connections. These are what we call uh, silicon interposers, and they tend to be expensive, but that's the current technology widely used for interconnecting these chips. But uh, recently, we are developing in the industry some organic interposers that are made from these uh, epoxy mode compounds with these uh, dielectric materials like polyimide and then with plated copper lines. So all of these structures provide that electrical interconnect at a comparable speed but in a uh, more cost-effective solution. And since it has a CTE closer to the overall package, then it also reduces package stress. So those are some of the innovations in our industry on how to connect these chiplets. Great. Well, maybe let's now jump to your work at DECA. Could you explain how your background relates to what you do and then how DECA's technology has an impact on everyday technologies like smartphones and computers? Yeah. So thanks, David. So as a material scientist and engineer at DECA Technologies, I work on developing materials and packaging solutions needed to solve the advanced packaging problems that we just discussed. Having a background in material science and polymer chemistry helps me understand how each material in the package will interact with each other and how each process step in the package buildup will affect these materials. So at DECA, we're constantly innovating new ways to package these chips or chiplets and how they would be integrated together. So as we innovate, it's important to consider the packaging challenges that I mentioned earlier. So Let's take, for example, the application processors or APUs in our mobile phones, such as Apple's processor or Qualcomm's latest Snapdragon chip. 
instead of connecting the processor unit to the memory chiplet side by side, the memory chiplet is mounted on top of the processor in a 3D arrangement. This enables the application processor to have a smaller package footprint, thus making our smartphone smaller. So at DECA Technologies, we develop these interconnect solutions so that we enable high reliability packages that, that can withstand strenuous reliability testing required by these chip makers, while also enabling the increase in electrical connections between the processor and the memory. All of these in the packaging point of view makes the APU run faster with lower power consumption. So that's just an example on how we use material science in uh, advanced packaging. It's really fascinating. And one thing I wanted to just quickly focus on is you talked about how your background in material science allows you to really dive into how materials are interacting with, with each other within the electronics. So I was just curious how, how many, like, are, is it just like one material is interacting with another material or is it one material that could be interacting with several different material types, material classifications at, at one point? And if you can maybe give an example of some of the things that you're looking at in terms of, you know, the structure property relationships, how it's processed, you know, the composition of the material when it comes to identifying some of these interface challenges or, or considerations to make sure that everything is working properly and in tandem? Yeah, that's a good question, Punit. Actually, when you're into semiconductor packaging, there's not any one specific material class or specific or specialization that would be useful. Because in semiconductor manufacturing, oh. we use uh, factors, right? So traditionally, it would be silicon or materials like silicon carbide. We use polymers, we use ceramics. And of course, with these copper lines, you have, you have a good background of metallurgy. So all of these come together in advanced packaging. So let's take, for example, one of the issues that we typically encounter in semiconductor packaging is CTE mismatch or package stress. So as you well know, CTE is the coefficient of therm expansion, right? Thermal coefficient. So these materials will expand or contract at different rates when heated or cooling or cooled. So let's take, for example, the silicon chip. It has a typical CTE of 3 ppm per degree Celsius, while the epoxy mold compound or the polymer that encapsulates the silicon chip, it has a CTE of around 40 ppm, almost more than 10 times higher. So by adding round silica fillers dispersed within the polymer matrix, to make a epoxy mold compound, its CTE is reduced to 8 ppm, thus reducing the CTE mess match between the mold compound and the silicon. And in turn, this reduces package stress. Other innovations that we are looking into advanced packaging is using photoimageable dielectric materials such as polyimide, which is important in creating patterns in the package using photolithography. These patterns will later on become the copper electrical lines between the chiplets. And to create even higher density connections, we have seen new polyimide materials that are being developed that you can create thinner copper lines at two microns or less, or even thinner than bacteria cells. And speaking of interconnecting chiplets, a hot area of development is hybrid bonding, where silicon IC chips are stacked on top of each other using extremely fine pitch copper to copper bonding. So this hybrid bonding connects these chiplets without the use of traditional solder balls to make the interconnect speeds between these chiplets very fast. So this technology is currently used to create high bandwidth memory chiplets or HBMs that can stack up to eight DRAMs. So these chips are used for high-end GPUs and data server chips. So, so those are just uh, examples in our advanced packaging space wherein we use different disciplines in the material science. So I'm very curious. I understand that making things thinner or smaller is a benefit for the price and then maybe uh, it can also reduce some of the complexity of your design. But I assume most of this is for a cost saving point of view. Can you give us like a very rough number of like how much money you expect to save or what's the performance increase when we're talking about like these micron differences within the chip? Mm -hmm. 
That's a very good question, David, though I, I may not be able to give you exact numbers. The challenge when you go to the next generation of uh, silicon IC nodes or next generation of ICs is as you cram more transistors and transistors, they become more expensive to produce. So they become more expensive is because if you have, for example, a single piece of round silicon, let's take, for example, a 12 inch round wafer, as you make the circuits more dense and more complex, a single piece of dust on that silicon wafer, you would damage already a couple of these uh, small chips, right? So that would translate to lower yields and increase the cost. Now, if you go to a earlier generation of IC nodes, so let's take, for example, if you're this chip maker, instead of choosing your memory block with the latest generation together with your processors, you can just choose the next generation or maybe two generations earlier, wherein the yield or this the sensitivity of the IC node would be not would have a less impact on cost. So this strategy with chiplets help out with that development for the chip makers. So Benedict, I was just w wondering about the flexible electronic displays. Is is it commonly used with in tandem with kind of the traditional display technologies that we've seen in the past, like LCDs, like liquid crystals, or is it just purely like organic electronics there, a, a display technology, and then like liquid crystal display technology is, is separate? Or I'm just curious, because right now I'm envisioning kind of that, the the foldable Samsung phone that, that we've seen, right? And the flexible display technology there, is it more so at that kind of the, the bending part, right, where we see mm -hmm. potentially mm -hmm. organic electron electronics, or is it throughout the throughout the screen? That I'm just curious about that. Yeah, I think the unit is basically as you look at all these displays within the industry, these are made possible by different technologies, right? Just like what you said, some of them are made from traditional LCDs or liquid crystals. Some of them are using organic LEDs. Some of them use uh, flexible el electronics and tradition. Some of them use uh, traditional semiconductors for the circuits. So let's take, for example, the big display screens that are being used in uh, those buildings. So you can envision that using uh, liquid crystals or organic liquid crystals. But since the, those surfaces are relatively flat, then you would use uh, traditional circuitry to turn those pixels on and off. Now, as we go to flexible devices like the folding Samsung phones, then instead of organic LEDs with traditional circuitry, you would use flexible circuits using organic field effect transistors. So all these technologies and organic electronics come into play to build these new innovations in our electronic space. That makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. So let's move on to the topic of organic photovoltaics now. So the, the, this material is gaining attention for its potential in renewable energy. So can you discuss the material challenges and breakthroughs in developing efficient organic photovoltaic materials? especially in terms of their molecular structures and properties, because we've seen with photovoltaics and solar cells in general, efficiency is a big, big discussion topic. Yeah. Thank you, Puneet. That's a good question. So when we think of solar cells, we always see the ones on our rooftops, right? Those uh, black panels that are made of silicon. So another development in organic electronics is organic photovoltaics that you mentioned earlier. So organic photovoltaics or organic PVs, they can provide a low cost and accessible solution for the further adoption of green energy. So the advantage of organic PVs are they are low cost relative to compared to traditional silicon based PVs because they can be produced on a roll to roll manufacturing process that have higher production yields and can be easily scalable to larger volumes. And since organic PVs are flexible, lightweight, and they come in film form, we can easily utilize them in existing structures, such as building walls, curved roof, or even windows. We don't need to construct special structural supports on rooftop, on our rooftops, just compared to silicon solar panels. You can literally just roll out these organic PVs onto most flat surfaces, like wallpaper, essentially. 
So a high-rise building with organic PVs can easily become a mini solar farm. And as you mentioned earlier, one of the key functions or the key characteristics that we looked into PVs is the power conversion efficiencies, right? So organic PVs have a lower power conversion efficiency of around 8 to 12% compared to silicon PVs that have efficiencies between 20 to 25%. Organic PVs can offset this by having the potential to be installed in underutilized areas within cities. So in the future, we could envision green buildings with photovoltaic walls and windows keeping your building cool while harvesting clean energy as well. Now, going to the main challenges, aside from lower conver uh, conversion efficiencies, organic PVs have shorter lifetimes. So since organic PVs are based on organic materials, these molecules degrade at a faster rate compared to traditional silicon PV cells. So much research is being done on new NCAP and the contact materials or the absorption materials to improve the lifetime of these organic PVs. Now, to further improve power efficiency, on a molecular level, material scientists look at the molecular structures of light absorber materials, wherein they tune the structure of these materials so that other wavelengths beyond visible light can be used to generate electricity. So in fact, scientists are researching tandem solar cells combining silicon PVs and organic PVs wherein the silicon PVs absorb visible light while organic layers will absorb shorter wavelengths in the UV spectrum or also longer infrared light. There's even a novel approach of using organic luminescent particles in tandem with silicon PV cells. You can have these organic luminescent particles dispersed in the solar panel, which absorb UV light, and then they regenerate visible light using that UV light. And then that visible light can then be harvested by the solar cells or the silicon solar cells. So, so this increases solar cell efficiency, even on cloudy days. So the field of organic PVs is still young and developments in the future will surely make it a key contributor to green energy. Interesting. So as you're kind of talking about the future of the field, maybe if we just take a step back and talk about the future of electronic packaging, I think that you made a great point with the organic photovoltaics, but what other breakthroughs do you envision in the next five to 10 years or even 50 years for this field itself? That's a good question. So Within the neck, within the field of electronics packaging, shifting to that, within the next decade, we can see the greater adoption of chiplets. So right now, it's only it's mostly being used in high-end applications such as AI server chips. But in a couple of years, we'll be seeing it more and more at different application spaces, from high-performance graphics cards, car AI chips, mobile phone processors, and even Internet of Things devices like our smart devices or smartphones or smart watches. And then overall, as we see the amount of data being processed by AI growing exponentially, new packaging technologies that support emerging technologies such as electronics or even quantum computing will be developed within the industry. I know you, you, you were talking about the percentages difference from silicon versus photovoltaics as it stands right now, but I think another component that you mentioned that I wanted to emphasize is that it's a very young area as it stands. So you talked, I think you said eight to 12% versus 20 to 25% for PVs versus silicon. In the next 10, 20 years, do you see that, that there being a shift in terms of like, do you think PVs has greater potential to exceed that marker exceed uh, the efficiencies that silicon solar cells has in terms of the rate of that increase in efficiency over time? I think there's still a, a lot and uh, silicon or inorganic uh, solar cells and the other structures like perovskovite, silicon uh, solar periscovite cells are being researched, right? And I even watched one of your episodes talking to one of your experts on that field. I think organic PVs are still ongoing in their development to catch up with silicon, but it's not really a competition between these two technologies, right? One is higher efficiency, but with organic PVs, their main uh, advantage would be their lower cost and the ability to be used on certain structures like walls or windows. 
So it's part of the energy solution. It's not really complete competing to replace silicon, but be part of that uh, variation or that uh, field of solutions that we have in place. That makes total sense. So first of all, thank you, Benedict, for joining us today. And we wanted to just wrap this episode up with your advice for our audience in terms of how to stay updated in the electronics packaging field and just organic electron electronics um, as well. So do you have any particular resources that you recommend that our audience maybe checks out to stay updated? Or, you know, if they're students, what classes would you recommend they take? Um, because you, like you mentioned, it's, you know, there's so many different material classes that are used in, in electronics. So yeah, we'd just love to get your, your advice on this. Yeah. So there are a lot of resources online sharing the latest developments in semiconductor packaging. We have EE Times, we have 3D Insights. And I also recommend uh, for students or other professionals to attend events organized by professional, professional societies in the semiconductor packaging space, such as IMAPS or IEEE's Electronics Packaging Society. And in these symposiums or conferences, it's not just limited to professionals, but it's, we also have students attending in these, in these activities or these conferences. So if you're interested, I would recommend that you would look into that. And even the latest developments in advanced packaging is being featured in mainstream technology websites like Wired or Ars Technica, because we've always seen these buzzwords of chiplets with the latest AMD product or the NVIDIA product, right? Or from products from Intel. And having a degree in material science provides a good solid background for work in semiconductor packaging. So as I mentioned earlier, a lot of materials are being used for semiconductor packaging. So specialization in polymers, ceramics, metallurgy, and semiconductor physics are sought after. And some key skills that I would say uh, would be very desired for those working in the industry is finite element analysis, which is the basis of uh, which is the basis for thermal and stress modeling that we often use in our industry. So in general, as we are seeing more advanced fabs being built by companies like TSMC, Samsung, or Intel expanding their fabs here in the US, this is in part driven by the CHIPS Act and the drive for the country to have more U.S. onshoring of semiconductor manufacturing. Many universities are offering excellent programs targeting material science and semiconductor electronics. Thank you so much, Benedict, for joining us today. It was a pleasure having you and learning about the packaging space, organic electronics, etc. So we really appreciate you joining the show. And yeah, just excited to see the developments that, that continue to happen here. Yeah, thank you, Punit and David, for having me. I'm really excited and I'm really honored to be here. As a materials engineer, we can make an impact in nearly every single industry. But with that versatility comes a lot of different options to choose from. So if you have no idea which industry or position is right for you, believe me, you're not alone. I've been there, done that. But just for a moment, imagine narrowing down your ideal role in company by the end of this week. Imagine being able to secure your dream job offer without having to apply to hundreds of job openings. Our online course, MSE Academy, includes video testimonials, resumes, interview prep, and mentorship from materials engineers who have been in your shoes. We also connect our members with companies and industry professionals in our expansive network to help accelerate your job search as much as possible. To learn more and get started, simply click the link in the description below. And if you enroll within the next 24 hours, we'll add three bonus career development resources. I hope to see you there.